Welcome for uh, the seminar, which is uh, scheduled for a rather unusual day and time. And but it's also uh, true that we have a very unusual guest. Uh, so these two things come together. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome here Professor Martin Kay from Stanford University and the University of the Saarland. And I am very, very happy that he will reveal uh, his views on where com on what is computational linguistics. Well, and, um, uh, and well, he has been how to get the linguistics back into computational yes. linguistics. Yes, and I think this is a topic which is most welcome, especially in Prague. So thank you very much for coming. Well, thank you very much for having me. Um, you know, I don't really recommend getting old, but it does have some uh, good features to it. Um, you quite often can give a talk on things you want to give a talk on, and you don't have to get past the program committee. Um, and so um, that's one of the advantages, and I'm, I'm really going to take advantage of that today. I'm going to wander around in various places, and I just hope that you will find things either that support feelings that you've already had, or that will give you something to attack which you've been looking for anyway for a long time. Um, one way or the other, um, I have been insisting for a long time on a distinction between computational linguistics and natural language processing. For me, they are not the same thing. But the people in natural language processing have taken over the Association for Computational Linguistics, the International Conference on Computational Linguistics, and almost everything else with the term computational linguistics in it. So I just want to reflect a little bit on whether I think that's a good idea. There's a standard response that people like me make and make perhaps too easily. We say, look, computational linguistics is a science. It's about understanding things and explaining things. Natural language processing is engineering. It's about processing and well, doing things. Um, all that, of course, is sort of ideally. Um, is the world really like that? Well, let's ask ourselves, what sense does it make to talk about computational linguistics? What is it that should be computational about linguistics? This question, I think, really does have a good answer. The answer to this question is that linguistics, language, is about process. What everything that language is, is a process that is going on in the heads of people who are talking to one another. And the process part of it is as important, surely more important, than anything about it that is purely static, such as what you might find in a dictionary or a grammar or something, the process is really very important. So the important question always is, how do people do it? What is it that they're actually doing and how do they do it? Well, okay, so this is all idealization. The other half of it, as I was claiming, is that um, natural language processing which for some reason I have called NPL. I guess I have in mind natural processing of language. It's not what I had in mind. I'm a bad typist. Um, so NLP surely is engineering. The question that really we do have to bring out from the back of our mind and look at squarely is, is computational linguistics a science? After all, where did computational linguistics start? Well, it started with machine translation. 
It was all about beating the Russians who had just put up a satellite that they called Sputnik and they had all this stuff in Russian and the Americans decided that if we were not going to be beaten by the Russians we had to be able to read the stuff that they had written and to the great dismay of the Americans a lot of it turned out to be in Russian. Um, and as I've said many times, you cannot expect Americans to read things in foreign languages because our Constitution says you cannot indulge in what's called cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> um, so, you try to work on science, um, you try to work on machine translation. If the machine translation had been a, a r roaring success, we wouldn't be worrying about whether it was science or engineering. We'd just be happy to have solved the problem. But when MT fails, which, let's face it, is essentially what it did, then you say, well, that's OK. We were doing science. We were not doing engineering. Well, computational linguistics, let's look at it as a science. Let's see what we can make of it. What has it given us? What do we have as linguists? as a result of what computational linguists have done. Do we have anything? My answer to that question is we have an awful lot. We have a huge amount. We have, for example, finite state morphology, a way of doing morphology which is oriented towards processes, which explains why, the pro why you can have one specification of morphology which accounts both for the way people produce words and for the way people understand words. Normally when you design processes, they don't give you the two halves of the coin. Finite state technology does. They have given us parsing and generation. Also, the same specification, the same grammar, working both as a model of the hearer and as a model of the speaker. Not, so, not a trivial accomplishment at all. It has given us constraint-based grammars of various kinds. I could spend a whole lecture arguing why constraint-based grammars are superior in so many ways to process-based grammars. Um, but that would be, as I say, that would be another talk. They've given us a lot of stuff on anaphora resolution. Maybe they've even given us an interest in anaphora resolution, much of which we didn't have before. They've given us a huge amount of work on discourse and dialogue. There's only one problem about some of these things. Let me take one in particular. Um, passing and generation, what we, the scientists, did there is probably fairly good engineering and rather bad science. It's good engineering because it shows you one of the best applications of what's called dynamic programming, how to do in cubic time what on the face of it it looks, is going to, looks as though it's going to be a, a, an intractable problem. But that dynamic programming system unless you change it from its originally proposed form in major ways, is an altogether implausible uh, model of how people do things. It supposes, for example, that when you analyze a sentence, however long it is, when you get to the beginning, you still have a completely accurate memory. I'm sorry, when you get to the end, you still have a perfectly accurate memory of what the beginning looked like. And it doesn't take very long to convince yourself that this is avoiding one of the major aspects of psycholinguistics psycho that you have to face. How can it be that you can still handle the end of the sentence when you no longer remember the beginning? Nevertheless, on balance, I think what linguistics has received from computational linguistics has been a major benefit. So, how do things look today? Well, we have a Klein, we have a long stretch between one extreme and another. At one extreme, there is um, 
Noam Chomsky, who's been there at one extreme for over 50 years now. And to pick somebody to represent the other extreme, well, when you're in Prague, that's easy. Um, that would be um, Fred Jelinek, I would say. Um, I think what will, it will be reasonable to take these people as representing extremes. In Fred's case, perhaps not quite so obvious. In Chomsky's case, fairly clearly. Um, so Chomsky is the exponent of now a system called minimalism, but a whole tradition of what was called transformational grammar. A grammar which is based on process. What did I say we need? I said we need process. You look at a transformational grammar and he tells you step by step what you must do in order to get this sentence. You must do this and if you do this before you do that then you will find that this is in the way and you can't move this into that position therefore you must do the other before you do this and so forth and so on. It's all very very careful step by step specification of process. At the other end there's a serious computer scientist who's concerned about specifying the processes that will go on in a machine not because he's trying to mimic processes that go some, on somewhere else like in somebody's head but because he wants process that will, processes that will achieve a given end. Notice that typically the way Computer scientists strive to state processes in the most comprehensible way is to remove as many of the processing details as possible to provide you with a fairly static description of a number of clear states that must be reached without specifying the exact details of how they are to be reached. This is anybody who's learnt anything about programming knows about trying to do things is, and, uh, in as declarative a manner as possible because when stated in this manner they are comprehensible furthermore details that we don't know about we don't state we do them of course we make our machine do them but they are not made part of the key statement of the algorithm so we have Theoretical linguistics, I would claim, over on that end, but perhaps not that far. Somewhere along the way from process to declarative statement is theoretical linguistics, somewhere in here. And computational linguistics, it seems to be, should not be quite as far over as NLP. It should be somewhere in here. So, as I said, what worries me about Chomsky is exactly the reverse of what you would expect. He is too computational. There is too much process. It becomes an implausible model, psychologically speaking. There's too much detail there. At the other end, there is a purely, it's not purely declarative, a largely declarative um, way of stating things. So, transformational grammar, as I said, describes Processes on the low, on a level of great detail, far greater detail than a scientific theory ought to contain, in my view. Um, in computer science, this is not usually regarded as a particularly revealing way of saying things. And it's entirely implausible that people do it this way. And finally, something that I have spent my professional life arguing for is that it's not reversible. The most important thing for me that a linguistic theory has to have if it's going to describe what people do is it has to, describe, it has to use the same specification of the language, let's call it the same grammar, for the speaker as for the hearer. We just simply never encounter the situations where somebody says, oh, do you know the French for this? And you say, yes, well, I know it as a speaker, but I don't know what it would be like as a hearer. 
I mean, people just don't say that sort of thing. It just doesn't make any sense. And it ought not to make any sense. When we learn something, we learn it for both purposes. If we know it for one, we know it for the other. I've claimed that um, you can't understand processes if you get too close to them. There has to be a level at which you pass from declarative to process, and that level should be as declarative as possible um, before you actually get into sequences of steps. For example, here is a way of not understanding how to do division in mathematics. It is the way that was taught to me when I was very young. Um, and I'm not going to go through the details because I couldn't. I wouldn't know how to do it. This is called log division. And you, the arrows tell you how you sort of put things down in certain places and move them around to other places. And you just have to remember. It's like so many things that we learned in school. You just have to remember exactly what to do. I hope you're working this out. I haven't worked it out. I just um, did it and then forgot it again. There's an even worse case, actually, than, and that's um, doing square roots. Do you remember being taught how to do square roots? I was staying as a graduate student at the International House in Berkeley, California, discussing this with a mathematician friend of mine. And I said, do you remember how you were taught to do square roots? And he said, yes, yes, the first thing you have to do is to separate the digits off in pairs with a little tick mark like this. And somebody on the other side of the table said, no, 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 you separate them off with commas. <laughs> um, and this was, this, was what the, this was the level of the argument. Okay? This is the way, at this level of detail, this is how you do not understand something. Um, so now let's look at the way linguists have tried to understand some things. Um, let me go back to the pre-Chomsky days, the just pre-Chomsky days. Let's go back to structural linguistics. Big thing in America. Um, big revelation in America because um, People encountered in America languages spoken by indigenous peoples that were altogether different from anything anybody had encountered before. They had no writing system. They had no way, ready way, made way of even writing down the things that you heard. It brought, it made you realize much more strongly than you'd ever realized before that you don't even know the difference between one consonant and another unless you know something more about the language. You can't just simply listen and write down what you hear. You can't do that. So they had to learn a lot of very, very basic things in a very, very fundamental way. Um, this has been regarded sometimes, I, I think it was Charles Hockett who made this um, um, uh, comparison between the early days of structural linguistics and chemistry, where what you're trying to do is simply to discover what the elements are that language is made of. What's not exactly a periodic table, but what the elements be, uh, could be. And they are, of course, things like phonemes and morphemes and seememes. I remember also at Berkeley, some, we had these arguments about um, the word cranberry. Um, cranberry is a berry, strawberry is a berry, blackberry is a berry, blackberry is black, blueberry is a berry, blueberry is blue, cranberry is a berry, cranberry is a cranberry. So the question is, is cranberry two morphemes or one morpheme? And the person who taught this course, who can't be offended because he's no longer with me, said, ah, you don't know with us, I mean, you don't know the meaning of cran. It's obvious. It is the meaning of cranberry minus the meaning of berry. <laughs> okay? See? Um, and so you can organize these things in their own kind of periodic table. 
and you have something that looks a little bit like somebody's mouth and certain of the vowels are higher up and certain of them are lower down. And what's important is to know, are these two things the same as one another or are they close enough so that in this language they're different from one another? Or, you know, what's going on in this language? There are actually three dimensions because there's rounding and unrounding, but paper in those days was two-dimensional and most of it stayed two-dimensional. So um, we have to do something else about the third dimension. If you get the elements right, then you can start getting the compounds right. You can start putting things together in an interesting way. So you can, for example, write a single rule that tells you about how to get a lot of things in a North American English that you don't get in other kinds of English. So here is a rule that covers all cases with all vowels um, of this so-called North American flap. And you, you, you uh, describe the molecules in terms of what elements they have to contain in order for this rule to apply. And if a, uh, an element isn't mentioned there, then it doesn't matter whether it's in the compound or not. So this tells you that if something is an environment following a stressed vowel, and preceding an unstressed vowel, and if it has these properties, then it gets pronounced that way. So, in my dialect of, of English, there are two words, latter and ladder, and in North American English, there is one word, ladder, and it sounds exactly the same for both of them, and that's this rule that describes that. Okay, the thing is that doing things this way one rule covers many instances because it has a way of talking about compounds in terms of the elements that they contain and that that is something that is very very important for linguistics in general and computational linguistics in particular. Here is an example of why it can be important. Um, this is a little grammar of what I call English morphographemics. The word morphographemic is not used very often, um, mainly because ordinary linguists are not concerned about graphemics for the most part. They're not very much interested in writing systems, whereas computational linguists who work with texts um, are interested in writing systems. This tells you about the spelling rules of English. If I put the entire grammar on the if I showed you the entire grammar, it would be twice this size, but not three times, only twice this size. I'm not showing you the other part because it's purely procedural. It's purely set up and tear down. It's not interesting at all. A lot of it could be done away with. But this tries to capture generalizations in the way I've just been talking about. So it says we're going to define something called a sibilant. And that's going to be any of these letters here, including any of these digraphs here. We define a consonant. We define a vowel. Notice we do not define Y as a vowel. Define it only as a consonant. Um, we define a couple of boundary markers, this one between words and this one between morphemes. Um, we don't see morphemes, of course, in English spelling because what we're going to claim here is that there are morpheme boundaries in the lexicon, but they all get removed before you actually see any words that are produced. So these rules are going to delete some boundaries down at the bottom here. Um, and they're going to do things like change a Y to IE under certain circumstances so that TRY becomes TRIES. Um, and tie, when followed by ing, becomes tying with a y. E gets deleted under certain circumstances. Certain consonants get doubled when they're followed by a vowel, but there has to be a morpheme boundary um, in just the right place. So you don't double a consonant if there just happens to be an i following, but if there's a morpheme boundary in between there, then you do. You double a B, it becomes BB. You double an M, it becomes MM. You double a C, it becomes CK. 
um, because, well, that's the way it is. That covers the whole story. Um, it actually, that's not quite true. It covers all you need to know in order to do inflectional morphology. If you want to do derivational morphology, um, then you need about as much, you need another page like this. Um, still very manageable and still complete. Can it be, is this too much work to have people do it? Shouldn't we be learning? There are people who write programs to try and learn this stuff. You can write this down in a day. Somebody who knows English can write this down in a day and it's over. Um, a little bit of experience helps. If it's the first time you've ever looked at these rules in this language, maybe you'll take two days. Then you compile it into a finite state transducer, which has 103 states and 2,368 arcs. The alternative to doing this is to take a large piece of paper and draw this diagram with 2,000 odd arcs in it. I'll tell you something, you'll get it wrong. You'll make a lot of mistakes. Knowing what the generalizations are, knowing that they work, really is extremely useful. We look at elements in morphology the same way. We try to find things that are orthogonal to one another. So words in the Substantive paradigms have cases in many languages and they have numbers, but they're orthogonal to one another. That's to say you pick a case and independently you pick a number and independently you pick a gender. Maybe on top of that, these systems are divided into completely different colonies of words, which we call declensions and conjugations and such. Knowing what they are, Writing the grammar enables you to get a coverage far greater than a vast corpus of naturally occurring material could possibly ever give you. It's simply beyond imagination. Furthermore, it will be right. Do not, as Kim Mokoskinyemi famously said, do not guess if you know. Okay. Here's another example, then, of catching generalizations. Here is one rule that will put, in this case, French suffixes together with French stems, OK? Actually, in this case, only verbal ones. But it'll do all the verbal ones. So what we're going to get is a word. So it's something of type word, and it's going to be a verb. And it's going to have some lexical property. I put the question mark to show that this is a variable. It's going to have some tense. It's going to have a person. It's going to have a number. And how are we going to know what these are? Well, um, in order to discover what they are, we're going to need need to know what conjugation the verb belongs to. So we'll have a variable for that, too. Um, and we're going to take the lexical value. What is this particular verb? And we're going to carry it from the stem. That's where it's going to come from. Crucially, absolutely crucially, we have to find a suffix which agrees in conjugation with that. If it agrees with conju with the, in conjugation with that, then we may take the values of these, other val the, of these other attributes here and copy them over to there. By virtue of this, we need say very little in order to describe quite a lot. I could go through it and show you how you get from those two to this one. I'm sure you could see yourself um, how that would work. Um, the point is that you have one rule that covers all in this case, finite verbs. Same sort of story in syntax. Um, the sort of system I was just hinting at there will cover agreement. You can also talk about head features, which means that one or two or a very small number of statements will tell you how um, important and often quite subtle properties of the head of a phrase are inherited by the phrase itself. 
you can describe very simply and very transparently notions like subcategorization, modification, long distance dependencies, and so forth. All of which are real phenomena, all of which um, will be reached by NLP one day, maybe. We don't know. Um, so, data bags with features in them are potentially very, very much richer in information. I think it's fairly easy to see that this has to be the case. Um, so, for example, if you have a tree bank that contains many instances of noun, singular, accusative, mass, but few instances of words that contain all of these features, then you have very, very much richer information to go on because that, that data bank can tell you about words with features. It can tell you what's going to happen to singular nouns, not what's going to happen to the world word child or something. Huge difference. Um, Chaniak has a paper in which he describes getting out of the pen tree bank the grammar that is implicit in it. It's a simple context-free grammar with no features. And he got out a grammar that contained 10,000, 10,605 rules, of which 3,943 occurred, on, only, only a third of them occurred in there more than once. Which means, in my dialect, the other two-thirds were of very little interest at all. Yeah. Um, he says somewhere else in the paper, I couldn't resist writing it down, he says, at about 11,000 rules, our grammar is rather large. Okay. So, how can we get the best of both worlds? Well, I couldn't resist since, as I say, I didn't have to get past the um, program committee, so I couldn't resist um, trying to make some suggestion, one could make many suggestions, about how people on the two sides of this fence might get together. How one might take the best things, and I mean, forgive me for the way I've approached this, but I mean the obviously wonderful things about natural language processing, and put some computational linguistics back into them. Let's not get rid of them. Let's put the computational linguistics back into them. So I'm going to suggest, if you'll excuse me, very briefly, a possible hybrid architecture for machine translation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about signs. And the signs will have potentially quite a lot what is a sign? Um, it comes from de saussure, and the idea is that it is a word, as one member of the sign, and something corresponding to the word, let us say a meaning, whatever that may be, as the other member of the sign. When we work on machine translation, we take the word in the other language as being essentially an approximation to that meaning. So we'll be working with a pair of words, one from the source language and the other from the target language. Okay? So, um, but these are not the only two fields that we could possibly have. We could possibly have three or four. Um, you may know that head-driven phrase structure grammar talks explicitly about signs all the time. So it relates a word to its phonology, to its syntactic marking, and to any other important grammatical properties that it might have. Potentially, uh, a word in another language. Um, so, my sign-based machine translation system is really going to have four parts conceptually, though only one part from an engineering point of view. It's going to have this part here from an engineering point of view. The idea is that we look up the original and we find a bunch of signs, one for each of the possible words in the other language that might be translations of this word. So we get a number, in general, a number of translations for a given word. 
Then we have a source language model. Current machine translation systems don't have source language models because you say to yourself, what's a language model for? It's for putting words in the right order. Well, the source language words are already in the right order, so we don't need to worry about that. The trouble is that we then go on to throw the order away, which is perhaps going a little bit too far. Um, I am going to use my source language model really as the counterpart from the target language model. You see, it's target language is putting words in the right order, giving them, given the meanings that they are supposed to have. So I'm going to look at the source language and say, what meanings could these words have, given that they are in this order? All right? So I will see which of the sequences of signs, not of words, but of signs, which of the sequences of signs are most plausible, and I will take that as an indication, as part of my assessment of the probability, of what the translations of these words are. So... Um, the source language model will be built on pairs, on signs, and so doing this is a kind of word sense disambiguation. It tells you something about what these words perhaps mean in this sentence. Then I'm going to use a chart model for what I'm calling the reordering step. Why? Well, because if I, Martin K, stand in front of an, an audience and don't use a chart model, people will wonder what's happened to me. Um, and then I will have a target language model. Both of, my, both of my language models will be based on suffix trees. That's a technical matter. We didn't go into it, but it's my preference. So the interfaces between all of these are sequences of signs. Okay, so now I'm going to give you an example. I'll talk a little bit about this example, and then I'll move to another one, and then you'll probably have heard as much as you can take. Okay, so here is a French sentence. Um, and if you don't know French, you will need to know before we even start what this sentence actually means. So I did the obvious thing, I typed it into Google Translate, and um, this is what it means. Okay? Well, actually, I wouldn't put it that way myself. Um, it says, the shuttle between the island and the mainland delivers it. All right? But as Google is already hinting at, there are possible other meanings for some of these words. Um, so some of them, if we put some of the possible, just some of the many, many ways you might um, deal with this sentence together, we get things like this. So the shuttle between the island and the mainland delivers it or him. That's the one we want. The shuttle between the island and the solid ground. The shuttle between the island and the mainland closes the book. Ferme, closes, le livre, the book. Um, um, the shuttle enters the island, entre l'île, enters the island, and the mainland closes the book. All right? The shuttle enters the mainland, closes the book. The shuttle enters the island and the solid ground closes the book. This one perhaps a little bit surprising. The shuttle enters the island and the solid ground closes the pound. Well, the word livre in French can indeed mean pound, but it's feminine when it means pound, so it would have to be la livre. But we don't know anything about that. We're just looking at the words. Okay? So we're going to look these up, and we're going to get a bunch of signs, and a sign can cover one word, or it can co uh, cover, as in this case, a sequence of words. So our dictionary tells us that la terre ferme can be the mainland. And we assess on the basis of our language model the probabilities of each of these in the various sequences that it can occur. And I'm going to absurdly simplify this and assume that it just prefers one of each of the possibilities. Of course, what it's going to do is rank order them. 
So it's going to choose the right ones. It's another thing you can do if you're delivering a talk. You can choose the right one and nobody gets to even ask how you manage that. And then, so we delete the rest and that's where we are at this stage. Okay? So now we're moving to the reordering um, step, which is actually where all this occurs, and we introduce what I call the chart model. And a chart has a bunch of nodes, one between each word, and an arc connecting the nodes to show various possibilities of things that connect those nodes. And the interesting thing about charts is that having put in a basic set like this, you can, using grammatical rules or whatever the rules are, add more and more information in the form of other arcs in here. So, for example, I could imagine for some reason um, introducing an arc here which said, these two words constitute a phrase and in the output this phrase will have to be reordered in the other way, so it will not be um, delivers it, it will not be, sorry, it delivers, it will be delivers it, okay? Um, so as I say, in fact we're not selecting items, we're establishing preferences among them, we don't reorder, we prefer some orders to others. Okay, now forgive me, I'm going to change to another example. Um, that one gave me far too many um, possibilities to pursue. Um, so I want to very quickly, and it's going to have to be very quickly now, um, go to this one, um, an English sentence and the various possible ways that it might occur in German. The reason for doing this is, of course, we get not one result but several results. Um, I'm assuming that we don't get ones where the subject is discontinuous from the verb. The verb, I'm taking it, will be adjacent to the subject. It's rather difficult to find places in German where that's not the case. So we have these signs here, and if we knew more than we're supposed to about German grammar, we'd known that the verb has to come in the second position, we'd know that this is the subject and it had better be adjacent to the verb, so either in first or third position. We'd know that this is the first object and it must occur somewhere, and that this is the second object and it must occur somewhere too. But hang on a minute, we don't have a grammar. Where's this grammar coming from? We don't have one. Well, let's assume that we have a grammar to the extent that we will move things, we will reorder things in the way that some grammar could have allowed. All right? We don't know what that grammar is, but we won't make any moves that could not be made by some grammar. Okay? So this is actually going to be picking up on a very interesting suggestion made by um, D. K. Wu. He called it inversion transduction grammar. So here's the idea. You take your string of words, or in my case, signs, and you assign all of them to one grammatical category. I will call it T for terminal. Then you introduce some rules. Here's a rule that says N for a naturally ordered non-terminal. That's to say where the two things are going to stay in the order that you found them in is an N. So I can put those two together like that. Um, well, there's, I can introduce a rule that enables me to, put, to say an N consists of two T's. Then a T and an N gives me another N and once I have that rule, well, we can cut loose and put all the rest of them together. That's what we can do with two rules. That would simply be give you a translation of this sentence into another set of words where the corresponding words were in exactly the same order as the original. Um, then I can introduce some more rules, which is this time a reverse ordered phrase. So this is the same tree, except that this is going to put these two words in the opposite order. 
something which I do not want to happen. But that's what this, this rule would do. By judiciously picking ends and R's, I can get a lot of reorderings. Not, it turns out, all of them. But I can get a lot of them. So in particular, I can get from the man gave the boy an apple, einen Apfel gab der Mann dem Jungen, which is a very different ordering from the original one. Just a quick remark that if I do what I've just explained to you, I will get more than one grammatical structure for some possible reorderings. And I don't want that. I just want one way of getting every possible reordering. And so let me just show you very, very quickly. I can get ABC in their original order by saying N goes to N, N goes to N, T, or of course I can get it out of N goes to T, N. So I, re I eliminate N goes to three of those things, and I eliminate R goes to another three of those things, and the result of that is instead of 18 rules, I have only 12 rules, and I have exactly one way of achieving every possible reordering that any phrase structure gamma could possibly produce. Um, the numbers that you get out of this are still very large. So um, if you have a 20-word string, then there are on the order of 10 to the 18th possible permutations. We know that you don't talk about permutations. You don't ever compute all the permutations because there are always too many of them. Um, we're not going to produce all of anything, right? but um, there's a very large number. We can cut down a lot if we look only at reor reordering trees. And if they're binary, uh, we can cut down even more. And those numbers decrease quite dramatically when we go from 20 down to 19 and so forth. Um, these numbers of the reorderings that you can get are, g are given by a more or less well-known series, they're called the Schröder numbers. They are the number of possible ways of reordering sentences. And it's important to know that certain reorderings cannot be reached this way. So, der Hund hat der Mann dem Jungen gegeben. The man gave the dog to the boy. You cannot get from that string to that string by using the technique that I've just described. Two approaches you can take that, and that is, one is to say, all right, we're not going to do those, we're going to assume that there's always another way to do it. Turns out that seems to be sort of justifiable almost all the time. Um, the other thing that you can do is to introduce two more rules to the grammar, but they have four things on the right-hand side instead of two, and if you do that, you get all the orderings. So this is one way to start um, introducing a tiny little bit of grammar, a tiny little bit, things that could be grammar rules but that aren't. Another thing that you could do is to say, well, some of these trees are a priori just on the basis of their geometry. Never mind the linguistics, just on the basis of their geometry. Some of them are more or less plausible. The ones that have a lot of what's called center embedding are less plausible than the ones that don't. It's well known that human beings don't like center embedding. They like what's called self-embedding even less. Um, so center embedding, the famous case of that is to use the house that Jack built. From each of these, this is a children's little thing that, that, that they learn to say. And out of the, each of these, you can get a noun phrase. So the house the malt lay in, the house the malt the rat ate lay in, or the house the malt the rat the cat killed ate lay in. All right, this is a perfectly good noun phrase. Take it from me, I'm a native speaker, if that makes any difference. The fact is, whether it's a perfectly good noun phrase or not, it is incomprehensible, okay? And it has only three self-embeddings. You can count self-embeddings. The amount of self-embedding in here is to be found in the following way. If you take this word here, and you want to get from this word to the top, you have to go zigzag, zigzag, zigzag. 
the number of times you have to change from zig to zag, or the other way around, gives you the amount of center embedding. Turns out that you can compute that, you can associate an x and a y with every node in there, and so, and now you can write yourself a little formula which computes these two on the basis of these four, and you know when you get to the top how much center embedding was involved. I won't bother to go into the, the details of that. Only one more thing I want to say, and then I will have used up more time than I have. One is that if you have the system that I've just described to you, you can introduce what I will call real grammar rules in a purely opportunistic manner. If associated with your signs, you do in fact have grammatical information, part of speech information, gender information, declension information, and so forth. And you want, to, and you think you can do a reasonable job, at least for this week, of recognizing certain kinds of noun phrases. Then you can write rules that recognize those noun phrases, put them into here, and um, require that they just meet a few very simple requirements. You give them a higher priority than simple reordering rules. You say that to apply a simple reordering rule will cost you one euro. To apply a rule that I wrote, a real grammatical rule, will cost you no euros. They are free. So, if I can get the sentence cheaper, I will. And I will take it that if you manage to use more of my rules than the automatic rules, you're probably doing a better job. Notice, however, that I in no way affect the robustness of the entire system. It will always be capable of getting at least everything that the original purely statistical system got. It will simply be guided little by little more in the direction that I want it to go in and will thus be, it seems to me, perhaps the ideal kind of hybrid system. Please excuse me for going on a little long. Um, this is the end, which if you put it into Google Translate might come out in French like that. Um, but whether it would or not doesn't matter. We're going to do it by hybrid methods. So thank you for your attention. So now I would like to open uh, the floor for uh, discussion. Yeah, please. I'm, I'm sorry to break in like this, but I'm, I'm a linguist. Oh dear. And I happen to work for Widener Communication in the United States some 25, 30 years ago. And I just wondered what happens to the Russians and the machine translation? Um, Since you, you started to talk about the race, which is really a fascinating story when you look back on the, the roots of all this. The Russians are... I don't, I don't know... I should know more than I do about the answer to your question, and I'm embarrassed to say that I don't. Um, in particular, I do not know how much statistically based machine translation work is ha going on in Russia. I have no idea at all. I know that approaches using, uh, that rule-based approaches are still being pursued in Russia. Um, and um, friends of mine that go there frequently tell me that they're very impressive. Um, but um, beyond that I can't say. Concerning this 
this Russian system. I know one, uh, and there are people working on on it. Uh, it's rule based, and they have been working for, on it for like uh, two decades, I think. And add up. It's the yes, thing. yeah, yeah. It's very highly regarded, I believe. Yeah, and they are combining it with some statistical methods, but I'm, I'm not sure really how, how far it goes. Yeah, but, but they are they are very good, and they are. Uh, I think they have some competitions going on, and they uh, they are uh, the best or the second best. In the this this uh, jives with what I've heard. Yes, thank you very much. I really should know more about this, and I don't. <laughs> okay, so you know, uh, well, I have one question, but maybe it's a very trivial one or nonsensical one. Uh, when you spoke, <coughs> sorry, about the re possible reorderings, um, so I guess some of the reorderings um, are or maybe excluded by scope by the scoping. Uh, they are there. I mean, the order is there because of some scoping <coughs> uh, reasons, so to say. So, do I understand well that uh, when you, in the end, when you spoke about some rules which can be uh, added or employed, that this might be one of the uh, opportunistically added rule which may help. Uh, Absolutely. It's exactly what I had in mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, I made it sound as though these are, would be just the rules that you might have written anyway if the whole thing were going to depend upon the rules. Um, I suspect that it wouldn't actually develop like that in the early phases. I mean, nobody's tried this. The reason that for that is I think it would be... Um, there would be a change from the normal way that people like Dan Flickinger and so forth look at the gra gra uh, grammar engineering problem. He has to write a rule to cover every eventuality, even if um, it's unclear what really is an instance of this and what really isn't and so forth. I suspect that if you were doing this, your first priority would be to add rules in order by how sure you were that they were right. Uh, you would want to, because the places where you're not sure of are going to get taken care of anyway. And so what you want to do, what you will, be, you will, will I expect, develop a mindset where you're trying to write rules to get rid of mistakes rather than to introduce correct um, things. I would say it's even more trivial than the first one. Um, I would like to uh, involve uh, the people who are in, uh, on the statistical side of your first, uh, the two pictures you have there. And my question would be, I, <clears throat> when we discuss here some papers uh, con uh, employing statistical methods, it always occurred to me that some of the mistakes, or whatever it may be called, uh, which, uh, these, uh, which result from uh, the uh, application of these methods, can be avoided uh, by uh, giving in or by inserting some, I don't know whether to call it a moose or uh, something, because for us as linguists, it's clear that it, this should not occur. And the answer I usually get from those people is, well, we can't do that. I mean, we can't introduce something like that into the system. Yeah. So my more general question is how hybrid the system can be. Uh, what, what can we, uh, how much we can really make a hybrid system, not a sequential of this yeah. part, this part, and then back right. to this, and then back to right. that, but really the hybrid system. What do you think about I think you can, I see no reason why you shouldn't, why they shouldn't merge very, very, in very, very large measure. Um, I think, um, 
I think, as I say, one, one thing is that we would perhaps take a different view of, we'd be forced to take a different view of grammar engineering and how it works, and that would be interesting. Um, I think the claim I made at the end um, is true, namely that we would do nothing to damage the robustness of the system. Um, and those, it seems to me, would be highly desirable things. I started worrying about this when I was involved in a project um, devoted to um, design of hybrid systems. And they were trying to do exactly what you suggested. They were saying, suppose we were to take this module from this system and this module from that system and try to find some way of making the output of this become the input to that. And it just became a total mess. And you couldn't guarantee any of properties that the result would have. Um, and that's what I'm trying to, to avoid here. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of religion in here. We have to, we have to face it. I mean, you, you don't touch, you don't touch what the statistics tell you. You must not touch it. Um, um, and there's a feeling that in any case, touching it could never be productive. Um, you can never know as much about translation as you can get at looking at n million words of it. It must know more than you do about it. And part of what I was trying to persuade you of at the beginning was thanks to knowing what the elements are and how to make them into compounds, this just isn't true. We know more about it than it can ever know. <coughs> Sasha. Okay. Well, I, I would like to go back to, to your idea of using, for using logic in science for machine translation. And uh, it seems like it's very much uh, individual words, but there can be idioms or phrases that you might like to translate as holes. Yeah. But then in the target language, well, you can detect them as, as holes in the, in the source language, but in the target language, maybe they, they have to be reordered or they interspersed with other words. So it's, when, when you identify them as a sign, so then you, can, you, you probably have to break them into uh, something smaller. So that oh, you well, no, most of, the time, most of the time they can, I mean, even if there's a lot in the other half of the sign that could have been broken up, there's no reason why you have to do it. Once you've decided that this is a lexical unit that just happens to have some spaces in between, then um, you can treat the other one the same way. The, uh, of course there's a problem with things that are discontinuous. That's where the, that's where the problem really arises. And um, one would have to have some policy um, towards that. Um, one thing that would fall out is that if you had any reasonable way of handling discontinuous things, then you would at least require that what was skipped over would be something that was a complete phrase according to this overall combined grammar. So that would, that would remain a, um, a requirement. I see one hand which is almost up. <laughs> <laughs> this is not a machine translation problem. I actually have a question for the very, very beginning of the talk. Um, when we talk about the invertibility of uh, things, if you have a decorative description of something in language, then it's nice that it can be used for you know both ways. So I agree that for morphology this is fine, but when no cognitive science expert, but I, I remember I read uh, not one but a few papers where uh, by using the brain imaging methods, uh, it was discovered that actually for production of language we use a different part of the brain. So maybe it's not quite exactly true that we have one description and use it for both comprehension and production. Uh, so, but of course there must be some connection uh, anyway. So how, how strictly you feel about this, uh, uh, that we should really be trying to 
come up with a description which can be used for both. Maybe we should be looking at two different ones which have something in common but not quite the same. Um, I mean, you're right, this really is the nub of the problem. Notice, however, that in saying I want to be able to use substantially the same grammar for both purposes, that doesn't mean I expect to use the same processor for both purposes. And I suspect you can't use the same processor, despite the fact that I spent a lot of my life trying to make that happen. I don't think that psychologically speaking it's by any means necessarily what happens. There could be two parts of the brain that work on this stuff, but the, by and large, um, if I know a piece of language, I can use it for both purposes. That's what I claimed so far. If I'm really honest, I have to admit that that's not quite true either, because the, the English language which I understand is much bigger than the English language which I speak. There are certain things which I recognize, can understand perfectly well, and it never even occurs to me that I would never say that. It's just true that I never would say that, that I always have my particular choice. Um, so, no, these things are not exact inverses of one another, but I think it's appropriate to try and find a way that makes them looking, look as much like inverses as possible because the other extreme is chaos. I mean, you've got somebody who, won't, who speaks French but only understands English. I mean, you know. <laughs> well, if there are no further questions or remarks, I would like to thank you again and most heartily for coming here for giving us a very stimulative talk. And, um, uh, well, I do hope that this is not, well, I, sh I don't dare to say this is not the last occasion. I would say that we will meet more frequently than we did uh, up to now, and that we will see you here in short time again. I certainly hope that turns out to be true. Thank you very much.